So let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming and attend this uh, third chapter of our Innovation Week, uh, Meet and Learn. Uh, today, we are going to talk about design thinking, as you can see on the presentation here in front. Uh, I invite you to take your seat. Uh, if you can, you can even move forward. But today is a record. We have only a few seats available in front, so well done. Thanks for everyone coming. Today's presentation is about uh, design thinking, which is a problem solving methodology uh, that you might have heard or even applied in some of your businesses. And to do that, we have the pleasure to welcome Hervé. Hervé Conignon is a chief innovator uh, based in Dubai, and he's working for Hooks, his own company specialized in strategy and innovation. Hervé is foremost a designer. Uh, and also in his previous life, before uh, creating his own company, worked for large companies such as IBM and Procter. So welcome, Hervé. I'll leave you the floor. And uh, you are going to show us today the importance of the human being in the process of design. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, good afternoon. We don't know, well, we're kind of at the transition time. Um, how are you feeling? Yes, that's okay. You, you hear me correctly, there is no technical, uh, everything is, uh, thank you. <laughs> Well, I like to start this kind of presentation with a question. So uh, it has to be a bit interactive. Who of you thinks that uh, technology and um, artificial intelligence represent a risk for humanity? Yeah. I wouldn't say the oldest people in this uh, group. Uh, that wouldn't be, uh, but uh, actually, you know what? Uh, I think this is a fair question. We, um, let's say that we are at a turning point in our societies and businesses. So that's where we are, okay? And since you are working in the energy industry, uh, if I'm correct, I think it's, uh, it's the correct way to say that. Um, I think you are probably the closest or the, the most, uh, um, uh, the, the people, the, the industry that can really understand what's going on. Uh, let me just explain you a, a bit why. Um, we, we are living very interesting time. Put yourself a hundred years ago when electricity was invented, probably in the, the end of the 19th century, and try to look back the transformation that that followed. All industries have been touched by this transformation at that time. I mean, education, healthcare, communication, mobility, everything has been touched by that. Well, now going back to the 20th century when internet was invented, we are living the same. This is the beginning of the 21st century we are living exactly the same. This is a massive change in all our societies and all our businesses. The way that we live is, is currently being transformed. And there is no way back, by the way. I mean, we cannot just say, okay, we stop internet. That's, that's why that, because it has become a commodity. So we have to be fully aware of that. And we can say, we can be afraid of what's going on and what's going to happen. Or we can see this as an opportunity. And my point is to say that this is a real opportunity for all of us. And I'm going to demonstrate why. This is an opportunity because when you talk about digital transformation, you have on one side digital, which is as I said, internet, technology, all these different uh, uh, things that uh, 
boys likes to play with, you know, all these uh, phones and IT things. But beyond that, this is about transformation. And transformation has to be led by humanity. This is my point of today, okay? We have to lead this transformation. Otherwise, what is the risk? Yes, we might become obsolete. We might become redundant. And I know that when I talk to corporation like that, redundant is a bad word, okay? So this is our choice to take it as an opportunity. Uh, if, if that works, you see technology is weak sometimes. No, that's me. That's human. <laughs> well, you can, you can look at um, a digital transformation from different angle. You've got the what, okay? What, what it is exactly? What, what are the product? What are the solution that are created and that enable digital transformation? There is the how and the who. Um, these two things are interesting also. This is really how you're going to do your uh, digital transformation and who you're going to address and so on. I mean, you, you can take this from these two angles. Now on my side, sorry, this is me, uh, without the, <laughs> this, uh, I, what, what I propose you is to take uh, digital transformation from this angle, the angle of the why. And Actually, what design thinking helps to do is to understand the why that, that uh, uh, make customers, users, clients, whatever you call them, decide for something. Okay, so actually what design thinking is going to help you achieving is to understand the underlying reasons that leads to decision. I like to share this picture. What it is, okay, well, men and women, since the dawn of time, have to make choices. You wake up in the morning, which shirt I'm going to, uh, to, 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 to have today? Which, uh, which color of my shoes, what, I mean, we can ask many questions. What is important in, on, this, on this picture? What is the important thing? Is it the apple? Or is it the person behind it? And actually, this is none of them. The important thing is what is behind that person. What drives the decision? What makes her choose an apple versus a banana or a pineapple or a kiwi? This is what makes the, the important thing. If you understand what drives the decision behind it, then you have understood half, I mean, you are half the way this, because if you understand that what is important is what drives the decision and not the end point, that's the, that's the what, that's the how and the who. What I'm proposing to, uh, to help you to understand today is that what is important is the why. And I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, if you want to, to, to look at their, his, his videos on, the, uh, on YouTube. But the guy is making, I mean, he's really demonstrating the importance of the why for big corporations. Many big corporations don't know why they are doing what they are doing. And basically, they are set themselves uh, 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 up for, for failure. By the way, failure is not a problem, but when it comes to layoff, that's, uh, that's a problem. Okay, let me, let me now step back a little and explain what is design. Okay, design is a wonderful tool. It's a wonderful discipline to increase desirability of products. Okay, we, we know that. I mean, probably most of you have an iPhone, Apple, ooh, wow, that's cool, that's great. And yes, that's great, I love Apple. But uh, what they have do, done is they have crafted perfectly their products in order to increase the desirability. You would be surprised, by the way, by the fact they never ask anybody what they think about their product. I will explain that further. But 
Now, if you go to marketing, marketing helps to make the product profitable by putting it at the right place, the right moment, with the right people. That's what marketing does in a wonderful way. Okay. Now, if you look at engineering, R&D, and I know I'm in a company where there, is, uh, there are a lot of engineers, so you might understand that, is basically you make the product feasible. You make it producible. You make it, you make it happen because you add the technology, the functionality that will help to make it uh, producible and feasible, and, uh, and you put that on the market then with marketing. But, but what is important is to understand that the perfect balance between these three things is the most important thing. And if you look at an iPhone, it is definitely profitable. When you see the, uh, the value of Apple nowadays is just amazing. It is feasible, okay? And I, Maybe once there had been a problem with their antenna on their iPhone, but this is feasible. I mean, they produce it and they produce it millions of items, okay? So, I mean, this is definitely feasible, but this is highly desirable. This is what it is about. And the combination of the three things allows you to have the perfect balance between for, for a good product. So. Um, when I was working for Proctor, uh, they made a deliberate choice to, to have design as a function in itself. So we were not relying on a budget from marketing or from R&D. We are our own budget and our own influence on the products. Because they looked at this and they said, we want this to be desirable without being dictated by marketing or by R&D. And that's, that was extremely important because that gave us the freedom and the power to sit around the table and influence choices. But uh, what design thinking is doing is actually it helps you to understand the fundamental why, as I was saying earlier. This helps you to understand the fundamental why that drives to the decision. So that's one thing it does. And how it does it? Because it helps to understand the invisible motivations that lies under choices. That helps to understand the compelling frustrations that uh, drives again to some choices. And last but not least, it helps to understand the desires that sometimes leads to completely illogical behaviors. You all have that image of these people in the line the day before in front of an Apple store to get the latest iPhone. How stupid it is. Honestly, I mean, uh, sorry, I don't want to make any judgment call, but this is completely unrational. But this is real. Okay, you can, you can say, well, these people are completely nuts. And, uh, but that happens. You need to understand that. And because Apple has successfully been able to consistently create desirability for their products. The second thing that design thinking does, it's a wonderful problem solving uh, capability, I would say, methodology. So it helps you to understand the why, it helps you to solve problem. And I'm going to explain you how we do it. But what is interesting is when you create, when you solve a problem, you don't necessarily have the innovation. The innovation comes after. If you can systemize the solution, then you can create an innovation. Now, what is the difference versus other um, methodology is that it takes into consideration the first point, the why. 
because it is able, this methodology is able to get into people's hearts and feelings and emotions and all the drivers that lead to decision, then you can solve and crack any problems uh, 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 that you've got challenges. And I'm telling you that it is true and it's even more true for business challenges. So this, uh, this is not a magical uh, process. Actually, uh, uh, I'm not Harry Potter. The only thing that we have in common is the uh, front glasses. But, uh, but this is not magical. This is, this is a, actually a process. So uh, I, I love to share this, uh, this drawing because that's, for me, this is, this is summarizing exactly what's going on in the design thinking process. This is a creative mindset uh, 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 this is a process that, uh, that, that is supported by a creative mindset. This is a process that um, requires you to be um, iterative. That means it doesn't stop once you have the solution. Actually, there is, it's a continuous process. I used to say that innovation is a journey, not a destination. Once you have innovated, it, you're not done. You have to continue this process. And, and this is a, um, an agile approach. That means that you need to adapt it to, uh, to the problem that you've got to solve. So it is extremely flexible. But the common denominator and what is the most profound thing about this methodology, it is human-centric. And I don't know how much, uh, how many of you have heard about these uh, these two words, human centricity, uh, human centered approach. This is fundamental to design thinking. There is no way that it cannot be just uh, technology driven. It has to be driven by this specific mindset, which requires you to deep dive into human motiv um, uh, motivations, uh, interactions and behaviors. So how does it work? Let me show you now a, a specific case with Edwards. Who of you knows Edwards? No, okay, well, good thing. Uh, it's better for you if you don't know them. Uh, actually, they are the global leader in heart valve therapy. So if you have a problem of heart, then you might, you might know these people. But um, what is interesting is they came to us saying, well, we, we have a problem with our website, and I'm going to show you their website. So if you haven't seen a, a website from the 90s, uh, basically it was looking more or less like this. That was useless, beside the fact that in terms of ergonomy, usability, there was no UX. I mean, it was just, uh, sorry, user experience. Uh, it, it was just, it was root, you know, it was, it was like that. This is a professional education website. That means it is targeting all the surgeon practitioner in Europe, specifically in Europe. So there was, uh, you, you, you could access it with, uh, only with a, a login password. So it was very protected. And guess how many um, surgeons were visiting it? 10. I, I can tell you 10, because they registered, so they knew exactly. That was the problem. I mean, no, that was, it was not the problem. It was what alerted them. And it was like that for years, because people were trying to get on it. They stayed uh, five minutes, and they were leaving it and not using it anymore. And they had difficulties to be desirable, definitely, but more than this, to be use I mean, to be useful, okay? So they told me, yes, bring me some technology into that. It needs to be multimedia, you, you need to have videos and, uh, and, and PowerPoints. And um, they had teras of data, you know, videos and things like that. But nobody wanted to use this. 
So my role was basically to say, hmm, okay, guys, before to go and redesign this website, you need to understand what your users need. So what I did is I spent a day with that guy. And when I say a day, it was from 6 a.m. The guy gave me a, an appointment saying 6 a.m. on the morning at the hospital. And I left at 10, 10 p.m. So basically, the life of that guy is a very famous surgeon in heart, uh, uh, heart uh, surgery. But that guy was spending his time from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. working without any break. You know, he was basically started his day with uh, all his team, uh, briefing session, then he was going to see the patient, then he was going back to his office to do stuff that I will explain you after. Then he was going to the patient room again. Then he was going to the surgery room. Then he was looking, uh, meeting with other surgeons. He was doing, his day was just, I mean, that was exhausting. And I followed him with a camera. The only moment that, and the poor guy, the only moment he had some rest is I stayed with him for 40 minutes to interview him. But I prepared my question in order to really understand what was, what were his priorities. I, I did not try to fix, jump on the website, say, oh, yeah, I'm going to put video, this, and did it. No. What I did is I spent with him some time to understand his priorities. And what I discovered is that guy was spending 20% of his time on looking for certified information. The guy was looking for information, but certified. And the thing is, in fact, he was able to select and deselect the information because he had a lot of experience and so on. But I, can, I let you imagine a young surgeon, the guy is spending time looking for information, and he doesn't have this experience. So the solutions suddenly start to become very visible and tangible. So we did that, that, uh, that workshop, that design thinking workshop, where basically I told them, please, please help that guy to save him time. Save him time to stay with his family, to enjoy his family. Otherwise, the guy is just uh, running, running, and he's going to have a heart attack. So we went through the process of design thinking workshop. I mean, I'm not going to describe all the detail of it, but basically we start to work on personas because what I wanted is to have uh, young surgeons, young practitioners, and more experimented practitioners, but also have the interface of uh, Edwards uh, salespeople. And, and we went through the journey, understanding it, trying to draw what it looks like. Uh, th this is another example with, uh, with Bulgari. But we went through, again, a lot of discussions. Having a tool which is interesting because it doesn't look at as a journey from point A to point B. It is looking at the journey from before, during, and after. And then it's a cycle. That means that... As I was saying, innovation is a journey, not a destination. That's not something when you have covered everything, now you, you're done. No, it's never ending. And we cracked some solutions, but what was most important was after the workshop, what we did is uh, with uh, the person I work with is we analyzed all the, the information shared, the ideas and so on, and we created a whole strategy for them, for their digital strategy their digital transformation, basically. And, uh, and with uh, uh, three steps, where basically what we wanted to do is, okay, we're gonna fix your website. You asked me to, fi to fix your website, I, I fixed the website with a uh, very simple trick, for instance. You know, you provide the right information by, not the right information, but you inform the user on how much time is um, is going to take time to read the article, for instance. 
For him, that's gonna save him time. If he wants to know more, for instance, on a video, you've got a two minute video, but then if you want to know more, you can click and go to further uh, information on, uh, on uh, having the full video. So then what we did is we started to create a, 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 um, an interaction between the digital um, tools that we provided the, 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 the Edwards representative and the surgeons. And we created a circle like that. And then we created a community for all the different type of surgeons to, to also learn from each other. So what was good about this is we achieved a lot of, uh, a lot of great things with that. Better engagement from the, uh, from the surgeons. Then collaborative community, we created, you know, that interaction among all the different, uh, uh, these different people. And ultimately what was most important is to better serve the, the, the patient. At the end, this is what is the most important for them. And definitely for this community of practitioners, they have been upskilled, okay? They have learned so many things from each other. So um, better trained, I would say. Well, these are some of the figures, so I'll let you make the calculation, but uh, you know, the, the community of practitioners in, uh, in Europe is not big huh, in terms of uh, uh, heart surgery, but uh, we achieved this, um, uh, this result, and uh, the 7X, it's not a 10X, but uh, the 7X is their objective for 2020 to even increase uh, further, and uh, they're they are reaching this point. So here, what I want to say is, what we did with design thinking is was to we were able to really understand the pain point what was hurting and what was hurting was not the website that was the fact that no one took the time to understand what was the real difficulties from these practitioners and i would like to just to use a, a very quick example or metaphor on what we did i mean when you go to the doctor is the doctor telling you, well, do you want my super antibiotics pill? Um, well, but uh, what, he, what he does is asking you, how do you feel? What's going wrong? Tell me where, where it hurts. And he listens and he goes into that phase of understanding exactly what's going on. That's kind of a diagnosis, diagnosis uh, um, uh, phase where he's trying to really understand what hurts and from what I, from his experience he analyzed where is the real problem the fundamental problem okay so that blinks that's supposed to blinks so what we did actually was uh, was in that case and and in the other case that uh, we um, we help company with is we really try to understand, to step in the shoes of the users, customers, uh, clients, whatever you call them. And what we do is we, we, we try to see the invisible. We listen to the heart of the user. We, we really kind of try to understand what is, what is invisible to at first sight. We listen to their heart. So, you have been provided, let's do a little exercise together. You have been provided a leaflet with a post-it note on it. I would like you to give me in one word, what is your feel, what do you feel right now? I mean, it's very easy. And, uh, and yeah, feeling, what is your feeling? What is your feeling? Well, that, that's okay, beside that, beside being hungry. And Manon, can you please collect? And Manon is going to come and collect all the, um, the feelings. And what I suggest, Manon, can you stick that on the, uh, on the cupboard? Yes, here. OK? Yes, you can be tired. OK, well, if you're tired, can you? Can, uh, <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm going to continue while Manon is collecting all the uh, post-its. So now I would like to share some examples. 
okay? And uh, one of them is about Angie, but uh, before that, I would like, just like to share some videos you will see. I mean, you will be able to. So, who likes to go in the desert? Yeah, okay. So, who knows that car? FG Cruiser, FJ Cruiser. Yeah, you, you, know the, you know that car? You see it often, huh? I mean, as a boy, I love this car. It's, it looks like a toy. But the, the experience, who has experience ever to sit on the back of this car? No, okay, well, it's better for you because basically it's a nightmare. It's uh, the, the dream stops as soon as you start sitting in the back. You are definitely trapped. I mean, you cannot get out of the car. I, I, I did a, a desert race recently. Well, it was two months, three months ago. And um, interestingly, I was sitting on the back of the car. I, I love that car, I told you. But that car is a nonsense as soon as you sit in the back. You just cannot open the door. So imagine you have an accident. Your kids are in the back. And you have an accident and you're kaput. What's going on with your kids? I mean, they are trapped. And I don't know if this is the reason why they stopped the production of that car, but uh, because maybe they had some complaints about it. But this car is just so amazing in the desert, but you have to be to max. Otherwise, not good. I'm going to share now this um, video of uh, kindly shared by ACA Technology. It's about the, their, their project of an autonomous car. And you will see what, what is interesting is they have explored all the different way uh, a car has to be useful, but not as a car necessarily. So hopefully it's going to work, yes? I'm <laughs> 
Okay, that's quite amazing. And you might think this is science fiction. Um, I didn't share the new video because um, it was less showing this human interaction. But I can tell you they are already working on it and it's going to become real. And I know that uh, there are some, uh, you have some interactions with these guys. Uh, but uh, this is. I mean, this is really impressive because look at all the interactions. I mean, this is not just about technology. This is about usability. Um, now I've got another example where it involves energy again. Okay. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but this is the autonomous uh, suitcase. And can you imagine that? I mean, this is, I mean, I just want you to step back a little. When is the last time you've used a suitcase without wheels? Probably most of us haven't, okay? Maybe me because I'm too old. So, but, but honestly, I mean, this is something that we don't see nowadays. Now we even have four wheels. At the beginning, it was just two wheels, huh? but you still had to pull it and, uh, and carry it kind of more, more or less. It's just amazing. And this is going to happen. Okay, well, they, still, they will still have to solve the problem of batteries in, uh, in, uh, during flight, uh, but uh, that's another story. Now I would like to show, share with you um, a, another video, which is a, a very simple thing. And you will see there is no technology involved. No technology. It's just so human centric. So I hope uh, you will be able to see it. Yeah. I would say this is solved by people, for people. Isempre, alam mo naman, ganitong lugar, squatter area, tabing rilis, dikit-dikit ang bahay. Madilim talaga rin sa lugar ko na to. Wala kami dito sa loob, lagi kami sa labas. Nadaanan pa kasi madilim, nadaanan mo, hindi mo alam, may nakaharap. Nagtutulog na lang ako, lainaw eh. Ang tawag nyo sa akin dito si Mang Dimi Sular. Napaliwanag ko yung mga bahay nila magbilin. Bubutas ka ng yero, lalagay mo yung buti, lagyan mo siya ng silan, bago lagyan mo siya ng tubig na mineral, sa lagyan ng sunrox. Pag kabit mo sa bahay, lagyan mo silan ko para hindi tumulo. Ganun lang kasimple yun. Dati yung ganyan yung pukadilim nung bag for kapitan. Ngayon, nung kapitan ko na, ito na ang liwanag niya. Ito na ang liwanag. Pinili po ako kasi bote lang, tubig. Naliwanag na yung bahay mo. Pumaba yung ano ko, pinayakan ko ngayon. Sinimula ko makapitan ako dito. At saka itong solar battle bag na to, hindi mainit. Dahil sa bote na yan, sa solar na bote na yan, kumanda ang araw namin. Ang nalagyan na namin ito ay bali 643. Gusto na namin ipituloy-tuloy para maraming nga matulong ang mga tao rin na ano, yung maliwanag ang mga bahay nilang matidilim. Parang katulad na rin ng bumilya. Yung sa atin natin ako kalimutan na pakinabangan na ngayon. I think this happens in Philippines, uh, in a slum uh, there. So uh, you can see how a very simple idea can change things. So if you want to support, I will send you the... <laughs> um, 
Before to move to NG, I like also to show this example because it's a very simple one. I think that we just uh, forget about it, how easy it is to pay your bill. I know it's not a funny thing, but still, I mean, this is just so amazing, this, uh, this application. That's a real innovation in terms of service, and this is, this is human-centric driven. This is such a hassle to pay bills. Now you can do that at, a, at your fingertip. Okay, I know it's controversial because, well, we don't like to pay the bills, but uh, maybe, Stefan, now you can uh, introduce the... Uh, I will... I will but, uh, but if you want to say first. Yeah, yeah, just to jump in here, um, we are going to show you short video, homemade video prepared by uh, our communication team about ePass, uh, the run integrated solution. So it's a mobile app that has been developed by Mescat in collaboration with NG Digital. And it's a, a very interesting tool that has been developed using uh, what we have been discussing today. So the methodology of uh, Hervé uh, really starting from the ground, from the field, understanding what uh, difficulties or site or personal manager uh, might have on the ground. So it's an interesting movie showing the application of the, the application today, which is uh, under evolution. It's iterative, as we say. So this is where we stand at the moment, but there will be more to come uh, and more uh, development. So uh, this is to keep you updated. Yeah. NG. For Mescat Assets, we developed ePass, the Electronic Power Plant Assistant System. This mobile application allows operators to carry out their routine checks on a mobile device rather than using paper checks or basic apps. While there are obvious benefits in moving to a digital solution, such as better access of past data and tracking of KPIs, design thinking needed to be considered to ensure the app we develop fit the end user's needs and was easy to use. To do this, we started with operator interviews, shadowing them during their daily routine and understanding the existing pain points. For example, users were tired of entering readings as not applicable when equipment was out of service. Also, by taking knowledge from existing software solutions, we were able to take learnings from the pain points with these tools that limited adoption by the end user. An electronic form can be slower and more difficult to fill in compared to paper checks. After defining the scope, the Agile Make phase included ONM staff closely involved in the development of the application, the product owners. This meant we could constantly test releases, review, and make sure the end user needs were still being met. The application works through a desktop site for supervisors to manage the checks to be carried out and assign them to the operator. They can vary the shift and status of the plant to easily customize the readings for the day. They also automatically see the results, ideal for larger sites with many tasks and operators to manage. For operators, the focus was ease of use. The flow of the action cards displaying each check is automatic from one equipment to the next. The operator can seamlessly follow his round Filling in his readings on a custom mobile keyboard made easier to fill in. We also pushed to make the checks as simple as possible with simple multiple choice answers. To directly address frustrations of existing solutions, the operator can even change the status of the equipment to update the relevant checks for that day. The digitalization of a process gives an opportunity to understand existing pain points and review the process and optimize it. This includes perhaps re-evaluating what we ask from our operators to ensure only relevant checks are carried out. This way, they have a greater buy-in 
to the value of the task. By taking design thinking into account with the process, the software was developed not just for general automation or for performance tracking, but to solve specific problems for the end users. So this is an example of uh, digital solutions that we are developing using uh, design thinking, taking the pain points from uh, operators, people on the ground, and then coming with a solution and that will be further developed for larger plants, larger application. Uh, there will be more information during our digital uh, week or in the corner. Uh, I don't know when is it starting this, uh, Bridget? From tomorrow, so if you would like to have more information, the sound wasn't very clear. Uh, Dylan will be there as well as uh, Safra, so myself to explain. Uh, one more point, uh, you've seen on the corner a new wall uh, for your design thinking and your ideas about digital and data. So feel free to, as the wall before, write uh, what comes to your mind. It will be uh, very useful for us to understand uh, what you're thinking. Eve, I'll give back the mic to you for yeah. more exercise to close the Yeah, the I'm just going to close a bit that presentation and then invite you for the next step. Um, I started this presentation talking about the fear for technology and, uh, and AI and all these uh, consequences of this digital transformation. What is important for you to understand is it has, it is an opportunity as long as you understand it has to be, to be human led. Okay. It cannot be technology led. And I cannot believe this digital transformation happening if we leave it to the technology side only. And it's even more true in a country where we, we have a, a ministry of happiness. Do you know her? Have you seen her? I mean, uh, well, that's, that's very, she's a ministry, a ministry of state, okay? Um, I know it's a bit controversial because some people are saying, okay, well, that's marketing and uh, da da dee da da da, okay? But actually, this is not, and I can tell you because I discussed uh, very recently with uh, with a company working on this, is they are working on fully integrating this across the country with a very um, uh, detailed plan. So it is going to happen, but I think it's very brave for a country like the UAE to put that as a ministry of state. And this is a very strong indicator that when you have a country which is clearly setting the goal as becoming the most innovative country in the world and you associate that with happiness, then you understand it can only be driven by bringing or putting at the center of everything humanity, mankind. Why that? Because I think that this digital transformation will be successful with placing human at the center because it's going to help people to connect. We are all social. We are all, uh, uh, um, how to say that? Human beings are social animals. We know that. We like to live together. We live together, okay? And um, probably that's why we talk about diversity these days a lot. But definitely, it will help people to reconnect together and to connect together. That's the beauty of Facebook, whatever we think about this tool. It is connecting people. It will work only if we work on meaningful innovation. And I don't know if you know about this story, but uh, these 3D uh, prothesis, it's just amazing. I mean, it costs. $10 to create? Well, uh, when you had the more complex one. And, and that boy feels like he's a superhero in a way to overcome his uh, handicap. And, well, I like this picture and I hate this picture because 
I mean, you see the potential of, I mean, we don't want to be led by robots. We are not robots. I mean, look at this. These are our feelings. We have feelings. Robot will never get that. And, and the risk is if we don't put human at the center of everything, we might become obsolete and redundant, as I said earlier. So this is our objective. And we are all, we all have a role to play to make sure that we live in a happier world with the specific angle of using, I mean, using design thinking is, uh, I mean, let's put that aside. That would be a, a sales pitch. So I don't want of that. What I want you to understand is this digital transformation will happen and will be good, will be an opportunity only if we place a human being at the center of everything which is done. Well, that's it. I think, uh, merci. Yeah.